Coming back to you at our 11 o'clock hour, Tony D'Angelo here in Connecticut morning, December 3rd, 2013. And I'd like to talk to you about a very special year, 1963. Uh, several weeks back, we heard a lot about the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, but so much more took place in 1963 than that. And it really was a year that, for better or for worse, changed America as I have studied it. And uh, I'm about to uh, show you what I have found. Uh, and it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing. So in our first clip, uh, what I would like to discuss for a moment here is architecture. Now, man, that seems boring, but perhaps not. There is a building uh, which is still standing in New York. It's currently the Metropolitan Life Building. It's uh, sort of an octagonal oval, runs about 52, 53 stories. I worked there many years back. And uh, you might want to ask yourself as to why did they design that roof the way that they did? and sort of a curious story uh, involving a means of transportation that was supposed to be very, 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 very well utilized in the years to come, but didn't really happen for safety reasons. So Mark, let's roll this and then we'll get into our next clip about uh, what was then the Pan Am and now the MetLife building. Mel Allen would say in the old Yankee games, how about that? And that's really a how about that. How about taking a helicopter right to work, skirting over all the 95 traffic and the 91 traffic and however you travel and just ending up on top of a building and uh, having the door open and taking an elevator down to your desk, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Well, that's what they thought 50 years ago. But what they didn't really figure was the fact that helicopters are very, very light and flimsy and in bad weather are prone to crashing. And one did, and that kind of put an end to the uh, entire uh, helicopter as a commuter device um, exercise, shall we say. Here is another clip from the period of what was envisioned uh, with this heliport. Mark, let's roll this. Now, transportation was big in New York City in 1963, and the whole idea back then was modernize, 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 and anything old, uh, the thought was you had to get rid of it, and you had to do away with it, and you had to put something in uh, which was modern and could handle uh, new things, as it were, new volumes. Um, 
if you've ever been to Madison Square Garden, you might think that building was there forever. It was not. There was an old Pennsylvania station that was there that was an architectural masterpiece, but was determined to be obsolete at the time and was ripped up so the Madison Square Garden, which you know we now go to, could be built. And uh, there are many, many people who are still angry about that and would like to see the uh, old Penn Station rebuilt in the Farley Post Office, which is a block away because they were sister buildings, but that has never really seemed to give, gain any traction in New York or in Congress or anything like that. As a matter of fact, Madison Square Garden was just renovated, so uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to see the possibility of that ever happening. But uh, to remember, and to remember the days gone by in the railroads, here are some vintage movies in 1959 of what the old Penn Station was all about. And this is incredible. Mark, let's roll this. Just like 2013, things were being sold in 1963, and people drove, and people traveled, and people watched television, much like today. But uh, I love looking at old commercials and looking at things being sold and products gone by. And commercials back then were longer and a lot more descriptive. It wasn't the rapid fire stuff you see today. But, uh, you know, it's just an incredible time to look at some of the things that were sold. So here are a series of 1963 commercials that uh, the qualities may be not so great, but uh, the character of them is really indicative of the time, and I thought you should watch this. So, Mark, let's roll this. I'm George Jetson, and I live in the 21st century. That's Elroy. You have to watch him or he'll track up the ceiling. Here I'm dropping Judy off at school. Blondes away! Oh, that's Janie, my wife. Rosie! Coming, sir. Here I am, sir. Yes, sir. 
the old girl's still eager, isn't she? <laughs> but of course, very <laughs> H O M E L Y. There I go again. The toast of the 21st century. Oh, how I hate to pop up in the morning. Join us for a half hour of futurific fun with the Jetsons way out amongst the galaxies. Plan it, won't you? <laughs> oh boy, on ABC TV. If you don't think this is the most exciting car in America today, know what makes this car so exciting besides its obvious style? It's the Corvette's not-so-obvious engineering. The things you feel but don't see. The things that led Car Life magazine to award Corvette its coveted Engineering Excellence Award. Here's what Car Life magazine says about the Corvette Stingray. The Stingray has a chassis and suspension system years ahead of contemporary sedans. Bold in concept, thoroughly tested, meticulously manufactured. Handling has been vastly improved. The car is much more stable at any speed and thus safer. Chevrolet engineers assigned to the Corvette project have done an outstanding job. We unanimously vote them Car Life's 1963 award for engineering excellence. The fact is, the Corvette is a specialized machine, built for people who want the ultimate in driving. But this same spirit of engineering, this idea of special design for special needs, is true for all of Chevrolet's four entirely different kinds of cars, for 63. The Chevy 2, designed for people who want practical transportation in its most luxurious package, the Chevy 2. The Corvair, an exciting blend of family car and sport car. A family sports car. The most popular of all, the 1963 Chevrolet Impala with the jet smooth look of luxury. Four entirely different kinds of cars, but all with the spirit of the award-winning Corvette. The cars that keep Chevrolet going great in 63 at your Chevrolet dealers. Mr. Davis, that's not the new bike I showed you. Last. Well, I was showing off for Tommy and a tree got in the way. You have to get a new wheel. It's too bad. Yeah. I might get a new cigarette, too. Oh? Yeah, these taste hot. These cools don't. Okay, thanks. Come up to the cool taste. The coolest taste in any cigarette. Get Cool's white filter. Rich tobaccos, too. Taste extra coolness. Let Cool's come through for you. Mr. Davis, I've got that new wheel in stock. Good. And I've got a new brand of cigarettes, too. Come up to the cool taste, the taste to stay with every time you smoke. Uh, you could get your little Jetsons vehicle and you could sit wherever, and maybe that's not so far from the truth because uh, Jeff Be Bezos of Amazon was talking about using such a vehicle to bring your Amazon purchase right to your tour. So maybe we're in the age of the Jetsons. Mark and I were just discussing that a moment ago. Anyway, um, starting to get to the historical, um, a curious trip took place in October of 1963 between Jacqueline Kennedy, wife of John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, and her sister Lee Radswell as they went into Greece to visit a man by the name of Aristotle Onassis. Aristotle Onassis, uh, years later, had married Jacqueline Kennedy. And it was kind of a curious thing, maybe at the time not covered uh, terrifically by the United States press, but what is a married woman and her sister going to see a uh, rich Greek magnate for? And there's a whole lot of speculation about 
what was taking place at the time and uh, perhaps uh, he had some designs on what was happening in the United States and uh, you know was madly in love with Jacqueline and wanted to find a way to kill her husband I mean the speculation goes on and on and on but uh, it was the time that it was but certainly something worthy of mention and perhaps question in 1963 so Mark let's watch this and either enjoy it or scratch our heads or both Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's uh, quite a curious time, so uh, such as the year of 1963. I'm not even getting into the March on Washington uh, with Martin Luther King and the death of Pope John the 23rd, which uh, there might be some issues or speculation with regard to that, but uh, the, the man had a plan to totally reform the Roman Catholic Church in North America, which really, really, really never got off to the degree that it would have been had he been alive, so the list goes on and on and on. Anyway, you got to look at my favorite car of 1963, a car which I owned years back for a brief period, and one which I probably would own again if I had nothing but time and money. The 1963 Thunderbird, unique in all the world. Nine miles to a gallon and a 390 V8 with a four-barrel carburetor. Mark, let's give this a look. 1955, a new car is born, Thunderbird. This car and the Thunderbird that followed have been classics and set the styling trend for an entire generation of cars. 1958, Thunderbird introduces the first four-passenger luxury car and popularizes bucket seats. Every year is witness to new refinements, new ideas. Every year adds new luster to Thunderbird's reputation. 1961, debut of an exciting new look, Thunderbird is reborn. 1962, another Thunderbird original, the sports roadster. Now, Thunderbird Landau, 1963. Imitated? Yes. But no car can really match Thunderbird's very special kind of elegance. The personal console, the rich walnut-like paneling, and the swing-away steering wheel are all part of the magic that is Thunderbird. Others may try, but none can steal the thunder from Thunderbird. Thunderbird, unique in all the world. Unique in all the world, especially when you had one ten years later and it leaked oil and burned gas like a sieve, but uh, it's certainly just a, a really, really, really neat car and a really, really, really neat time. Um, there was a world after JFK passed on, and uh, history maybe perhaps does not tell you that, but I'm going to. And what happened was uh, Army and Navy were scheduled to play their annual game the Saturday after JFK was assassinated, but uh, they weren't sure if they were supposed to or not, but Jacqueline Kennedy said, my husband wanted to be in that game, and I think the game should be played. And the game was played in a very somber atmosphere in what was then Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia over on Market Street, and had an incredibly, uh, almost a freakish ending. Uh, Playing for Navy, Roger Staubach, uh, later a quarterback with the Dallas Cowboys after he concluded his military obligation and later a Hall of Famer. And for Army, the quarterback, Raleigh Stitchway, who never played professional football in his life. He was a helicopter pilot in Vietnam. But this is an incredible ending and an incredible time and just sort of a thing of uh, let's play the game to remember JFK and try to get America back to normal. So uh, this is early December 1963. Mark, let's roll this. President John F. Kennedy, a 
naval hero and true football fan, was eager to attend the annual Army-Navy game on November 30, 1963. I hope to be on the winning side when the game ends, he telegrammed the Navy coach. But on November 22nd, Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. As America mourned, the game was postponed from its original date. Then, on Saturday, December 7th, before a packed crowd in Philadelphia, Army and Navy met for the 63rd time. Navy had beaten Army four straight years, and again the midshipmen were strong. Led by Heisman candidate Roger Staubach, the midshipmen held a 21-7 lead with just over 10 minutes to play. But Army was not finished. Behind quarterback Raleigh Stickway, the cadets closed the gap to 21-15. And after Stickway recovered an onside kick, he led Army to the Navy one-yard line. But there, with the crowd noise deafening, the cadets ran out of time. Navy and Staubach came out on top. JFK's widow, Jacqueline Kenny, had urged the playing of the 1963 game in her husband's memory, saying that it would be a fitting tribute. And it was. A fitting tribute, and it was, and really a remarkable time and a great game played under uh, not the happiest of circumstances. Um, interesting event that happened in early December of 1963. Frank Sinatra, whom we know as Frank Sinatra, was probably the most popular entertainer in the world at that time, um, had his son, Frank Sinatra Jr., who apparently was following in his footsteps, uh, mysteriously was kidnapped. And there's sort of two schools of thought on that. Some people say this was, quote unquote, a genuine attempt to extort money from the Sinatras. Others say, well, this was a diversion to get everybody's mind off the Kennedy assassination, and it was totally and completely planned. We'll never know that, but it's an interesting thing when you actually look to see um, what was taking place at the time and that the son of the most popular entertainer was actually snatched from a cheap motel in Lake Tahoe, Nevada in early December 1963. The unthinkable, but only in 1963. Let's watch this one. ordeal of Frank Sinatra Jr. began while he was filling an engagement at Lake Tahoe. He was on the bill at the Hora Casino, and there was no shadow of the impending crime as he held the floor at an earlier performance. The young man was following in the footsteps of his father. The eldest Sinatra was the idol of Bobby Soxers in the 30s. While he was fulfilling his engagement at the resort on the California-Nevada state line, Young Frank was staying at this motel annex. He was having dinner before one of his shows when his abductors moved in. An FBI padlock seals the door of his room as clues are sought. A trumpet player, John Foss, was with Sinatra when the two armed gunmen spirited him away. Foss was able to give the authorities little help as police set up roadblocks within 15 minutes. The kidnappers, however, slipped the net and drove their victim to Los Angeles 400 miles away. They forced Sinatra to make the trip hidden in the trunk compartment. The elder Sinatra received eight phone calls with instructions on ransom payments, and in the early morning hours, more than two days later, was able to announce his son's return. Young Sinatra had been released a few miles from home as others of the gang picked up the ransom money. He had a long rest at his mother's house after nearly three days with little sleep. It was another ordeal as he faced reporters' questions. I was scared. I was a little bit nervous, naturally, but uh, the only thing I could do is hope for the best. What right, 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 confidence that it turn out all right? Thing. Over here. We just prayed that it I just, would. Uh, I just uh, hope. Sinatra, yes, sir. When was the first time that you talked with Frank? Was it when he was brought home, or did he talk to you on the phone beforehand? When he was brought home. 
When did you first know he was safe? When did you I learn? never knew that he was safe yeah, until I saw him. How do you feel now? How do you feel now, Mrs. Just Contra? beautiful, thank you. And may we be excused. When will you go back to work, Frank? Right? talk them out of it at all? While we don't know that. Uh, We're keeping sorry, him home sir, for a while. I'm not at liberty to release that Mrs. information. Mrs. Sinatra. Fellas, do you mind if we go now? Because I want right. to eat him. Okay, honey. Give her a big kiss, why don't you? <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What a year, and I'll tell you, there's more and more and more things to discuss, but it uh, was also the year that the Beatles were introduced to America. That we're going to save going into next winter, because that's really a fascinating tale how all that came about. Anyway, uh, ending on a very sad note, um, or shall it be a hopeful note, depending on how you look at 1963, Judy Garland, yes, the same Judy Garland that was Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, here, more grown up now, singing Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas on her television show, and you can just see the empathy in her voice as to what had taken place during the year of 1963. This is a very, very, very touching clip, and we'll close 1963 with this. Mark, let's give this a roll. Have yourselves a merry little Christmas Let your heart be light Next year on Side. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. Next year, all our troubles will be miles away. Once again, as in olden days. Happy golden days of yours, faithful friends who were dear to us will be near to us once more. Until then, we all will be together if the fates allow. Hang a shining star upon the highest bar And have yourselves a merry little Christmas Now And we'll see you once before, before Christmas, but nonetheless have a very, very, very Merry Christmas. Judy Garland's sentiment in 1963 and mine to you today. We will be coming back with our friend Jim Dreyer talking about all matters sports and uh, a list as long as your arm, which I have prepared and just can't wait to get started. It's Tony D'Angelo here on Connecticut Morning, December 3rd, 2013. We'll be right back right after this with Jim. <laughs>